Reasons I hate Christmas. Number 65. The awkward moment of accidentally re-gifting something to the person who originally gave it to you. Merry Christmas. Oh, thank you. Oh, it's so sweet. And, uh, oh, it's, a, it's the same gift I bought you last year. No. Yeah. No, no I bought that. Mm, I yeah, bought that. no, you didn't. Yeah, I've had it in my closet for about a year. I bought that. I know, because I gave it to you last year. That's so what? Been in your closet. Wow. Thanks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Reasons I hate Christmas. Number eight. Going from the Arctic to the Sahara. Reasons I Hate Christmas, number 46. Hearing the same songs over and over and over. Here at 99.9, we know just what you want. Back to our 24 hour loop of your favorite Christmas song by One Hit Wonderland. Wait a minute, no. We don't need to play that for 24 hours. We don't need, there's better Christmas songs out there. I'm sure other stations have them. Why are they all playing the same thing? It's awful song. Why? No. Today's word that we're looking at is separate. When I first started looking and, and preparing these messages months ago, it, it kind of was obvious to me what the word separate was for. That we would separate fact from fiction, that we would separate uh, what, what a lot of people look at as Christmas and what the true meaning. Really, that's kind of the low-hanging fruit on that word, separate. It, obviously, any pastor could preach a message on separating the real from what is not real or, or the spiritual from the secular. And, and so really, I'd, I'd gone and done a lot of research, not, not really demeaning anything or putting anything down, but just looking to see where all the customs that we do today, all the way from the tree to the lights to the, the, the games we play, all the stuff that we do for the holiday, looking at where it came from, even when Christmas started being celebrated, some, some really cool facts about Christmas, about when, uh, it, uh, when a, a pope declared uh, December 25th would be the day we celebrated and all the facts up until then it was really cool stuff and I, I put the whole message together and was ready to do it and really was going to make everybody happy not put anything down y'all know what I'm talking about but still point us toward the true meaning and, and all of that and and, and last Monday, after, after uh, the ser sermon last week, Anticipate, after it was over, I w sat down, and I, I usually immediately look at what's coming the next week. And before I even left the church, I was scrolling through the next message, and I was looking at it, I was thinking, this is not what I need to talk about. And I was like, but I, I really wish you'd leave me alone, because this one's already done. The team already has it. Everything's done for it. Why are we going to mess with it? But I kept feeling Holy Spirit say, there's a different message. And so I sat down and, and, and started uh, digging through and saying, all right, what is it? Really, it aggravated me a little bit. And by Monday morning, I was good and aggravated. My quiet time with the Lord Monday morning, I was quite heated. Like I had a perfect good message and you're going to take that one away. What do you want me to talk about? I was like, if you could tell me, I would be okay. And so it was Monday morning when I, I, I got a different message from the Lord. But to be clear, I want to make sure that everybody here understands I don't have a problem celebrating Christmas. If you have the opportunity this year to come to a Christmas party at our house, 
you will see that I don't have a problem celebrating Christmas. Our house looks like Christmas threw up on it. I love decorating our house for Christmas. I love doing special things for my wife. It's just one of the ways a creative outlet for me is, is designing and doing things like that. And so I, I'm constantly adding stuff. I mean, I, she'll, she, last night she said, I never know where that thing's going to be. It was over there and now it's over there. And I said, I'm just trying to find its perfect place. And, and so I have no problem celebrating Christmas. I just think we don't need to lose our focus on what Christmas is for and don't lose our focus I believe it is an amazing time listen it is the only time that I know of that people think about Jesus whether they believe in him or not yeah. even people who don't confess him as Lord will sing "Oh, holy night people who don't even believe in him will celebrate holiday parties well, we didn't start holiday parties just to have holiday parties. They are centered around the birth of Christ. Whether people admit that or not, even the people who try to take, it's so funny to me, people who want to take manger scenes out of cities and take Christ out of Christmas and do all that stuff, yet they'll look for a Catholic church to go to at 12 o'clock on midnight, atheists to go to a, a midnight mass. To, come on. I mean, so, so here's the deal. I think we should celebrate Christmas. We celebrate Christmas and we do it big because it gives us an open door to share the gospel of hope. It gives us an open door when people are already thinking about it. Do you know the real meaning? It gives us an open door to talk to people about the real meaning. It gives us a, a, a chance to share the gospel of hope. So here's why I celebrate Christmas. Because people need to know the gospel of hope. So listen to that. We celebrate Christmas. We do all the stuff. We put, I don't have any problem with the trees, with stars, with angels. I don't have any problem with any. I, I have a collection of, of nativities. If you're ever wondering, boy, what could we give pastor? Nativities. I love collecting nativities. I love celebrating Christmas. But I most enjoy this time of year because people... Their hearts are turned toward Christ, and it gives us an open door. On Monday, as I started praying, he changed my whole message on separate. I was really looking at what we needed to separate from, and he began to speak to me about what we cannot separate Christmas from. He began to speak to my heart, and even as he did, I thought, Lord, I really, I really don't want to talk about that on Christmas. I mean, Christmas, we, we want to talk about the, the wonderful baby child. I read this theologian this week that said, no one should look to the cross on Christmas. You shouldn't discuss the cross on Christmas. It, it cheapens the, the immaculate conception and the birth of a baby. And, and as I studied it, as I thought on it, as I dwelled on it, I realized when you separate Christmas from the cross, what you get is idolatry. I remember in 1987, I wrote my full, first full-length children's musical. And this musical was called The Blemish Lamb. And I remember the whole thing, and at the end, and I, I'm a master in musicals of doing symbolism that nobody else gets. <laughs> nobody. I mean, you could have a, a, a stadium of thousands, and nobody would see it, but I see it, and I'm like, oh, did you see that? No, no one saw it. <laughs> but I put it in there, so it matters to me. And in this musical, at the end, it was all done. The kids had sang, Happy Birthday, Jesus. The lights go down. And in the shadows of the church beyond the, 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 the stage where the kids had sung was a cross portrayed on the wall. Because though we were celebrating the birth and the kids were all cute celebrating that, the shadow over the manger is a cross. When you, when you forget why Jesus came, you have the idolatry of a holiday that celebrates a baby in a manger. But forgets that that baby was born with a purpose. One of my favorite Christmas carols that we sang the lyrics from today, Hark the Herald. The lyrics that say, mild he lays his glory by. Born that man no more may die. 
born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. If you separate Christmas from the cross and you just celebrate a baby born, you, if you just worship the child, I always felt weird when we would sing, oh, come let us adore him. And I would picture people singing to a baby in a manger. Though I know he was a king even when he was born. Yes, yeah. he was a king. And, 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 and the earth knows to give respect to kings even before they step into their kingship. Yeah. He was a king in the womb. He was a king in heaven before he came down here. Yeah. We sing these songs, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Are you here, kids sing, Hark Herald the Angels Sings? And, and so it just becomes commonplace to us. Oh, we're singing that carol, Hark the Herald. And we all start singing and we sing and maybe with gusto we sing it. But if you're not careful, you miss these lyrics. Mild, he lays his glory by. Stepping out of heaven. Denying his rights to rule and reign, he steps down into flesh. John said, I've beheld him. The word became flesh and dwelt or tabernacled and lived among us. He became one of us so that we could become like him. Mild he lays his glory by. And then it says this, born that man no more may die. <laughs> If we just sing those words and move on, we miss what he's saying. Born that we no longer have to die. Born to raise the sons of earth. Raise them to what? Born to raise the sons of earth to their rightful place with the Father. Born to raise the sons of earth to their rightful place to rule and reign with Christ. There's so much gospel in these lyrics of this song that we would sing over if we're not careful. And just sing it as a Christmas carol. And we would miss. In fact, there's, it's so amazing. There are two verses that are never sung that go with this song. That are so full of theology you would choke on them. So full of theology about the finished work of the cross. In fact, they have been dropped from history because they were so beyond our understanding of who we are in Christ and what Christ has done in us. They're so full of hope that he already finished the work. And when Nicodemus came that night, is recording John, and said, what must I do to be born again? Jesus said, I'm going to tell you. What must I do to be saved? And Jesus said, I'm going to tell you. You must be born again. And Nicodemus said, how can I go into my mother's womb again? He says, it's not like that. There's a new birth that is coming. There is a, a, a being born again of the Spirit. There's something that's coming. I'm here to bring you second birth. Men and those who have been born again into the second birth will never die. I know we don't get that. And I know you had a grandma, a grandpa, a daughter, a friend, or someone die. And you said they died. But yet they live. They're more alive than you are. We don't get that. I know. And we grieve. And we hurt. But he was born that man no more may die. No more be separated from God. God. Born to give them second birth. I believe the writer of that hymn had so much, so much gospel truth. And is so filled with hope. Jesus came. <laughs> Jesus came to bring us life. Not give us a holiday. Amen. And I'm thankful for the holiday. Oh, I love, I love gifts. Who has not gotten a gift yet this Christmas? Anybody hadn't got a gift yet? Miss Jane, I saw, I saw a little lady behind you first. Would you hand that, pass it back to the little lady right there? She has not received a gift yet. Merry Christmas. Now you have a gift. <laughs> I'd hate for that to happen. I love holidays. I love gift giving. I love gift getting. There's a scripture I fight with in scripture. It says it's more blessed to give than to receive. I struggle with that at Christmas. Because I find getting very blessed. Come on, that nervous chuckle. You know what I'm talking about. I still look under the tree to see if my name's on something. I'll be at your house looking under your tree if I'm there, seeing if my name's on something. I'm still a kid who loves a gift with his name on it. And there's a gift with my name on it. Shoot. Woo! Ha! 
<laughs> engraved in the palm of his hands. The son of glory stepped down into humanity and said, your name's written right here. Want to come with me? And I said, I believe I will. And he said, let me raise you to a higher place. Let me give you revelation of who you are. You're not a slave. You're my son. Shoot. You have part of the inheritance. I got your name carved in me right here. Y'all know Jesus has got tattoos. Y'all better study the Bible before you get religious, telling somebody they're going to go to hell for tattoos. Jesus got tattooed on him. Go find it. It's in the Bible. He's tattooed. And, he's, and, and my, my name's carved. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Ephesians 1, 3 through 10. Ooh, Holy Spirit, can I just say thank you for changing the message? Thank you for changing the message. I did not want to preach about Santa or any of that stuff today. <laughs> Listen to Ephesians 1, 3 through 10. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ Jesus and with, in Christ Jesus. Woo. In Christ with every spiritual blessing. Somebody say every spiritual blessing. Every blessing. What does that mean? With every spiritual blessing. Now tell me what it is you're searching for. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. And what was it you needed? What was it you were begging for? What breakthrough? What next level? What glory? What goodness? What... I'm, maybe I'm reading it wrong. Let's read it one more again. Blessed be the fa God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. And where is it at? In the heavenly places. Bring that up. Next. In, in the heavenly places. Everything you need is waiting on you. Everything you need has been given to you. It's been afforded to you. You say, but it's in heavenly places. I got you. You snuck right up on it, Pastor, and then you, you, you hit me hard. In heavenly places. And we can't go there yet. Who said? Pastor, it's in heavenly places, and I ain't there yet. Well, why ain't you? That's right. That's right. Oh, why aren't you for my <laughs> northern friends? All my Pringle folks heard me, didn't you? Why ain't you? Well, Pastor, that's for when you die. No, it is not. No, it is not. In Colossians, Paul teaches us since then you've been raised with Christ. Set your mind on things above where your life is hidden now with Christ in God. It's up there. All the stuff you need is in Christ with God. There in Christ, everything we need, every spiritual blessing he has blessed us with. And all we got to do is receive it. Take the time to find it, to understand it, to receive it in Him. It is me. Listen now, listen, okay. In heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. Wait, you thought you chose Jesus. <laughs> even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. Wait, wait. He chose me before the foundation of the world. Is what it says. That we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ. You mean He never wanted me to be a servant or a slave? You mean all along His intention was that I would be a son? Why does somebody tell me this? He wasn't looking to save a poor old sinner. Cool. He was looking to reclaim a son. He was looking to raise the sons of earth. To say, come to the table. This is your rightful place. He wasn't having mercy on some old vile sinners. He was saying to sons, come to your rightful place. Come rule and reign with me. You say, I don't, I don't feel like I'm worthy of that. Of course you weren't. 
But in Christ, you have received every spiritual blessing you need, every gift that you need, every provision that you need. He has made you all that you need. You are complete in Him, not lacking anything. Listen, in love, He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will. It was His will. To the praise of His glorious grace, from which He has blessed us in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. See, some of you think God was not too wise choosing you. In wisdom, he lavished his love on you. He knew how to clean you up. He knew how to set you free. He knew how to change you. Man, this is good. I'm telling you something else. In all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose. Do you see how many times Paul is saying it's his purpose, his will. This is his doing. This is not your doing. You didn't decide to save yourself. He decided to save you because he loves you. Which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time. To unite all things in him. Things in heaven and things on earth. And Hebrews 2, 9 says, But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death. Listen, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. He has tasted death so that we don't have to. He has tasted death so that we could know life. I know as humans, it's really difficult for us to get this. We have to use spiritual minds to get this. You, you really, you, you can't because you try to figure it out. Well, you, okay, you say that, but if you're dead, you're dead. No, you ain't. Lazarus dead and, and Mary and Martha are whining about it. And blaming it on Jesus. Jesus, if you'd been here. I mean, they were blaming him. If you'd been here, they wouldn't have died. And Jesus said, he ain't dead. Yeah, he is. Four days stinking. He ain't dead. Jesus said, he ain't dead. He's just sleeping. And when I say, oh my God. When, When I give the command, he's going to get up. When I give the command, he's going to get up. He ain't dead. He's sleeping. He dead. He stinks. He ain't dead. He's still alive. Mary, Jesus, I don't know what you're talking about. Mary, didn't I tell you if you'd believe, you'd see my glory? I've heard someone say Jesus had to say Lazarus' name because if he just said get up, everybody would have got up. Thessalonians tells us that one day he will say, everybody get up. A command. (laughs) I am preaching myself slap happy this morning. I don't even need y'all to enjoy this one. I'm doing good right by myself. A command from the Lord. And everybody will get up. It was the Father's plan. It was his grace. And it was by that grace that Jesus tasted death so that we could know life. I'm so grateful. It was by this grace as Father displayed the richness of his grace for all creation to see. It was by this grace that he reconciled all things. We don't understand that. We still struggle to think a lot of this rests on us. We still struggle to think if we work real hard, we'll get it right. But the Bible says he has reconciled all things. And the sooner you reconcile yourself to his reconciliation, the better off you'll be. The sooner you begin to learn to say to the enemy, what are you talking about? You're talking smack up in my ear, but I already won, booyah. You don't got nothing on me. You say, but pastor, I'm messing up. Yeah, but he got it right for you. But pastor, I'm really struggling. Yeah, but he got it right for you. And your victory, he's holding. Get to know him. His grace will teach you how to walk in victory. The 
the thing that blows me is, uh, away in this passage in Ephesians is that Paul says it was settled before the foundation of the earth. Yeah. That we were already chosen. A way was already made and a plan was already set in motion. That blows my mind. Before the foundation of the earth. See, some of you made a mistake this week that you think, I don't know if God can do anything with this. And you, you're talking about God who before we were here chose us. Before we were here made a way. Before we were even thought about, had a plan and designed something for us. You can't separate Christ coming from the reason he came. You can't separate his coming from the reason he came. He came to bring us life. You know, second, uh, the second chapter of Hebrews, verse 10, says something very interesting. It says that by his willingness to suffer, he brought many sons to glory. Listen to that. Jesus, you can't separate the Christmas story from why he came. You cannot separate Christmas from the cross. By his willingness to come and be born in such humble conditions to grow and to learn his destiny and to accept his destiny, lay down his life. He, no one took it. He said, no one takes my life. I will lay it down. He accepted his destiny to the cross, humbled himself, dying on the cross, and raised again by the glory of the Father. You can't separate the reason he came from his coming. Amen. And, and I love it. I love Hebrews 2.10. He came to bring many sons to glory. Did you know he did not come just to save you? That is such narrow minded religion. He came to forgive me my sins. Praise God. There's more. Yeah. No, brother, that's enough for me. No, it's not. No, it's not. Because you'll, you'll live a life. You'll live a life of continual sin and thanking a savior for saving. He came to raise you to rule and reign with him. To be a son, to rule and reign with him. Behold, what manner of love is this that we might become the sons of God? John said it. To all who would receive him, he gave them the right to become the sons of God. That's what he's calling us into. So that we can show the world. You don't know, understand Jesus came to show us what a God man looks like. That will blow your mind. You say, well, he was 100% God and 100% man. Did, did, do you have a, 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 you know, what are those condos where somebody lives over here and somebody lives there? Duplex. duplex. You have a duplex with God? Like God lives over here and Satan lives over there and whichever one you visit is the one that controls your life? Oh. Isn't, that the way, isn't that the way some Christians think? Well, you know, that old two dogs got two dogs fighting. We kill one of them. <laughs> kill one of the dogs. Just uh, okay. All you animal lovers are gonna get mad at me. Saying kill. I don't. I, it was it was metaphorically and spiritually speaking. Don't kill a dog. I'm just saying that. Okay, God, please move on, Chad. Oh, that, I will not use that analogy in second service. I promise you that. He did this for us, and without proper understanding of why why Christ came, you end up with a pagan holiday. Without a proper understanding, then the carols don't make sense to us. Boy, when I sing, mildly lays his glory by, knowing that my king stepped down out of glory for me to rescue me. Wow. To bring me back to the table. Wow. Born that I don't have to die. Tasting death for me. We don't just celebrate a baby in a manger, but the birth of a Savior who came to save the world. That's who we celebrate. The birth of a Savior. Hey, listen, I don't worship a holy night. That, that's a, a cute little song, and it's a lot of people's favorite song, Oh Holy Night or Silent Night. If a baby was born that night, there was no silent night about it. <laughs> Stop it. So any, anybody that's had a baby in here know that baby was crying, pooping, and making a mess. 
and wanting some food. It was not a silent night. There were no halos. That round young virgin was tired. Come on. Come on. I know we make it all pretty and beautiful, but the fact remains that it was a reality. And I, I can only imagine, only imagine the seriousness of that moment when, when they realize Joseph has heard from, from the, the Lord and from the angels and Mary has heard and, and now shepherds show up. You, you, you mean he, huh, y'all were just in the field and the angels told y'all he was going to be king? You wait, wait for two weeks when we dive into what the angels really said. I've never heard anybody talk the truth about what the angels said. It's amazing what the angels said and we sing over. And, and, and I say said because it doesn't say sing, it says they said. And when, when you hear what the angels said that day and what he declared that day, we so miss it that God came there uh, not angry at us. I have this picture in my house on, on, on the wall that I found. It hangs up year round. I found it a few years ago or last year. I don't know, after Christmas. I just was looking at after Christmas stuff at Hobby Lobby and I saw this picture. And when I read it, I couldn't believe it. I was like, am I reading this right? Who wrote this? I can't find out who the author is, who created it. I've never seen another one like it. But the picture, there are three pictures in this, this writing underneath. And the writing says this, 2,000 years ago, a miracle happened in the ancient land of Judea. This is the story of a husband and wife. It became the story of a mother and a child. But from the beginning, it was always a story of a father and a son. Wow. And can I tell you that now it's the story of a father and many sons. Sing round young virgin, sing Ave Maria all you want, whatever. But this story is not about them. It's not about them. It's not even about him. There's this popular saying a few years ago, Jesus is the reason for the season. I have to disagree with you. Jesus didn't come for himself. He came for us. The king of glory did not need to step out of the glory for any other reason than to raise sons to glory. Pastor, how many times are you going to say raise sons to glory? I'm going to say it as many times as I can until you understand that the reason Jesus came was to raise you up to your rightful place. You're not called to be a slave. You're not called to live beneath. You're called to be the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. You're called to rule and reign with Christ. You are called not to be ruled over by the carnal desires of this world. You are not called to live beneath your rightful place. You have an inheritance. He has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints. He has qualified you by his death, burial, and resurrection and invites you in to be a son of glory, to understand that the king of glory came to bring sons to glory he did that for us today can we respond in worship to our father for lavishing his love on us in Christ and bringing us into relationship with him can we today say I will not separate Christmas from the cross I'll celebrate what he did to save me and if there is anything in you today that is separating you from Christ, this is the whole reason I'm sharing this message. If there is any ounce of separation between you and Christ, it is not on his part. It is yours. He is not holding anything against you. The written record of wrongs has been nailed to the cross. Your trespasses washed. 
Everything has been, you've been given every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. What do you need today? What is separating you from your spiritual blessing? What is separating you from life, from health, from peace, from joy? What is separating you? Would you come to the altar today and say, no more separation, nothing between me and thee? Would you come today and say, Jesus, I lay everything down. I don't want anything to keep me from all that you have purchased for me. Would you get honest today? Would you bow your head? Would you get honest today if you feel that there's separation, if there's struggle, if there's something you're going through, something you're battling, something you've been through? Or if you would say today, I've never surrendered my life to Christ, then you are separated by your decision. There's a simple decision that is separating you from Him. And that is the decision to trust Him for salvation. Will you trust Him today for salvation?